Teresa, how did you become interested in gerontology? Well, it's, it's funny, um, even as a teenager, my job all through high school, I worked in a long-term care facility. I worked in the dietary department, but what I discovered was I loved going out and when giving the residents their meals, chatting with them, and then of course there were some that were my favorites. So after my shift would end, I would go down and visit with them. And, but I really had no career aspirations, mm -hmm. but I, I knew I enjoyed that. Um, when I started graduate school at Penn State, I really intended to do something in adolescence, you know, who doesn't, <laughs> <laughs> at 22. And, um, but that first semester there, I took a course on intergenerational relationships, which was very, very heavily focused on adulthood. And Gunhul Tagestad was the instructor, and she was very dynamic, and it really just kind of opened my eyes to thinking, oh, this is something I could actually study and focus on in my graduate work, not adolescence. <laughs> so that was kind of the eye-opener for me. And also that semester I had been assigned to an assistantship with um, Kay Warner Shia, who did this cognitive study of aging. And even though I wasn't interested in cognition that much, just being exposed to the methodologies of lifespan development and it all just kind of came together. Yeah, and so yeah, so in a very short time, I really, I, I shifted my interest. I would say it probably took that full year to do it. Um, you know, because I had already kind of committed to a few things in the adolescent area too, but it was pretty a quick transformation over the course of my first year at graduate school. Wow, that that's just that is yeah. so inspiring, though, how you made the transition. Right, and I think because I had had those earlier personal experiences mm -hmm. as a, a high school student working, you know, it wasn't like it was totally foreign to me. I I just had never connected the dots that this could be something. I could do lifelong, right? You know, right. So, how? Why hadn't I? Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, you know, I, I speak a lot about my transition from elementary and middle school education to higher ed, and from you know adolescence mm -hmm. to gerontology. So, as you find out, there's mm -hmm. a lot of us who really started at one end of the exactly. spectrum and really end up at the other end of, right. the, of the life force. So, right. Kind of cool. Right. Kind of cool. Yeah, and I think the other part of it was um, in my program at Penn State, lifespan development mm -hmm. was so strongly emphasized that you didn't feel like you were wasting time or had done something that didn't have a purpose by looking at those earlier years because we really did consider aging to be a birth mm -hmm. to death thing, you know? So yeah. it all was okay. You know, when you look back, it all makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I think that's a key, Right. that's a definite key point. When, right. When you reflect back, it... Yeah, we find a way to make that narrative seem... Work. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, kind of going off of that, then, mm -hmm. uh, describe your career trajectory as a gerontologist. And at what point in your career did you maybe embrace the term gerontologist to then describe yourself? Mm -hmm. Well, so my trajectory, um, in graduate school, I think I really didn't start identifying with gerontology as kind of a home in GSA, for example, as a home until about my third or fourth year I got um, an NIA training grant. I, I, I became involved in that at Penn State. And so then you're with a group of students who are all on this training grant and you go to GSA and you have all these great opportunities provided for you with mentoring and stuff. So then I think that helps to kind of, you start to identify with that group and so that helped definitely. Mm -hmm. um, and there were many activities that we were required to engage in that kind of reinforce all those interests but also that professional identity. Um, so in graduate school, that was there. Um, but because my training has always involved kind of these various disciplines, I had, so I worked with um, someone who was a life course sociologist and did things in family, but did things in aging. And then I did a minor in demography and went to do a postdoc with someone who did demography of aging. So all of these things have to do with aging, mm -hmm. but not necessarily all of these people call themselves gerontologists. Wow. So it took a long time, I think. 
it was probably not even until maybe 10, 15 years ago that I started saying when people would ask me what I do, I'd say family gerontology. Wow. So it took, because I think in part just because I had so many mm -hmm. aspects to my career and, and sometimes feel a little lost, like where do I really belong? But the nice thing about GSA is you can come back to the Gerontological Society and you'll see your sociologist friends and you'll wow. see your demographer friends and you'll see the people from the family area and your work all has these common threads. And you can be all called gerontologists, but other meetings you might call yourself a family sociologist. Right. <laughs> that, that is kind of a unique... It's a big umbrella. It is. It is. And, the, and I think that's always fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. Who calls them? Who, act, who identifies as a gerontologist and what? Mm -hmm. and, and how do we... Do we Are we fluid? And we go back and I forth. think we maybe are. I know for me it's oftentimes kind of this situational identity. So depending on the t context I'm in and the people I'm with, I don't like to have to go into long explanations about things. So I use terminology and stuff that I think is going to resonate with whoever, whatever crowd or audience. I'm oh, great. So did you have female mentors who impacted your move into gerontology? Mm -hmm. And if so, who mm -hmm. and how? Yeah, so Gunhild Hagestad, my advisor in graduate school, was pretty key because, as I said, I took this intergenerational relations um, seminar from her my first semester of grad school. And just the ideas were so provocative, and partly because of how she presented it, but, you know, she really made us read the classics and uh, Shannis, you know, the uh, Ethel Shannis's work, and, and Gunhild had studied with well, not had studied, but her first job at University of Chicago, she had been colleagues with Bernice Newgarten, and yeah. so that whole influence, we read all of Newgarten's stuff. So what was good was Gunhild was a dynamic teacher and thinker and really got you to think about things, but also made sure that you understood the roots of our discipline. So, and Matilda White Riley stuff. And yeah. so, you know, today, in fact, last night at um, a session I was at, Actually, it was in the, the gerontologist board meeting. They were saying how they had done this special edition volume on our roots. And they said, you know, it's very sad because many students today don't know mm -hmm. who these pillars mm -hmm. of our discipline were. And I thought, well, I, I, that's how I was trained, you know. Um, we could not come out of that department and not know those names because they were so key. So I think that was important. She was important, but she also helped to us to see these other people who were so important to our field, and many of them women, like Newgarten and Lillian Troll and Matilda White Riley, and yeah. And and that is that really to us is kind of key. Mm -hmm. And when we look at our foremothers, mm -hmm. you know, of, of gerontology right. and. and the women that came before us. Right. And so it, it's just... Yeah, what it, they did professionally yeah. is so amazing. And then it's even more amazing when you think of... Um, I, I kind of over the years got familiar with Matilda White Riley's background and how she really was... It was posed to her that, well, you know, your husband's a sociologist. Right. You are, but, you know, you have children and you really won't get a job here. And so she... I mean, to come back into the field and do what she did and be at NIA as long as she was and stuff is just so amazing because of what she had to work against her right. whole career. Right. Yeah. So what, um, what do you think is uh, unique about being a woman gerontologist? Hmm. Well, I mean, I just named all these women who were big in the field, but you know, like so many, I think, disciplines that have a little bit of, you know, linkages to medical mm -hmm. fields, it's fairly heavily dominated by men, at least for many years it was. I don't think it is anymore, but who knows. Um, so I think that's interesting, because it's not like, well, we're in nursing or teaching or something where, you know, there's been that dominance of women. So you have to kind of make your way. Um, I also think because so much of what we study in kind of social gerontology and family gerontology are are heavily women's issues, mm -hmm. you know, but with caregiving and um, just, you know, I remember just aging and it was about women for so long, you know, if women were the ones who were in these aging populations we were right, studying. Right. Um, so I, I think that's interesting. Um, you know, just
just the whole role of being a, a teacher and mentor as a woman, I think, has is different for me. At least I've had students say that they feel like they get different mentoring from their women professors than men sometimes. And I do think that's there. At least for wi young women, I think I could relate to those challenges of, uh, of career and work. Um, and then all the personal side of this. Right. You know, as right. our parents are aging, and so it all just comes together and we're for me. Aging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's the personal and the professional, and then the mentoring. I think it all is a very different situation for women professionals than men. So kind of coming off of what you know, I mean, we're talking personal and professional. Mm -hmm. So then the question kind of comes as to how has being a gerontologist impacted? your own personal aging process then? Yeah. Well, I think it really, uh, you have to kind of practice what you preach, you mm -hmm. know? So as I've taught courses to students just talking about lifestyle and, you know, healthy living and community engagement and all these issues mm -hmm. we, we know are important to successful aging, um, trying to model some of that for them. Um, and think about it, and not only in the classroom to be talking about it, to but actually try to do it as a, as a person out in the community and stuff. But I've always been really heavily involved with volunteering and mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. of that nature that involve older adults. And in part because people would approach me because of my professional interests. So, you know, the Meals on Wheels um, board in Columbia, Missouri, where I lived for 16 years. You know, they approached mm -hmm. me about being on their board and and kind of helping them think about moving forward as we have baby boomers who are the older adults and what's going to be appealing to them in terms of the oh. way they offer their services and what they offer. So that certainly affected my, and my professional expertise helped me to be engaged personally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but also things I just gravitate to, like now I, I volunteer at a long-term care facility. and. I had, you know, when I've just moved to Denver within the last year and a half and trying to find ways to be engaged, and I could do a lot of things, but those are the things that really I'm passionate about and I care about, so it's, it kind of shapes how I spend my personal time. You know, it's, and it's what you're comfortable with, too. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, I could go in, and, you know, I thought about going and working in an elementary school and helping kids with reading, and I thought, but that's not really what I get excited about. Mm -hmm. and, it's, I really feel very comfortable with older adults. and So now I'm having to battle, though, the place I'm volunteering, they found out I was a gerontologist. Ah. And um, she goes, oh. <laughs> and I thought, so this, the other struggle, though, is then to say, well, but I don't want to come here and feel like I'm doing more work. So I have to tell, like, she asks me about creating and leading some things, and I'm like, well, you know, I kind of like just coming here and Right. Doing my little role <laughs> and visiting with the residents, and so that's what I'm struggling with right now. Is okay? Do I owe them this, or can I just tell them I really don't want to do that? I want to yeah. just be yeah. a simple volunteer. Yeah. And even you know, I was chatting with a friend on Sunday whose mother is having some significant decline, and I always feel like I want to be able to talk authoritatively with my professional expertise, but I also, they're, they're calling me so often more as a friend, right. not as, oh, you're a gerontologist, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I always feel a need to kind of balance it, even with, I have six siblings, and when we discuss my mother's situation, um, I, you know, I try to be engaged uh, at the same level they are and hopefully sneak in some of what I know, <laughs> because I don't want them thinking, oh yeah, she's the bossy, like, PhD. <laughs> I think she knows everything. Yeah, yeah. So we can use our expertise, yeah. but there are ways to do it, you know, and still be just someone's friend rather than the, the profession. <laughs> Within that framework, is there anything else you would like us to know, or that you think you know you would like to share with female, other female gerontologists, or even you know the students coming in and and. Yeah. Well, I'll be curious to hear, I, mean, I talk about this with friends all the time, is it, I think it's hard to get young people interested in gerontology. You know, it's not a very sexy thing for them. Oh, it's be true. much more fun to work with 
adolescents who are anorexic or something, okay. you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, or someone said the other day, oh, yeah, no, it's all about teen, or you, ch childhood obesity and blah, blah, blah. And, it, and so, I, you know, we struggle with getting people interested. And, and so I, I do, whenever I can, like to talk to people about how do you get your students, you know, passionate about working right. in the aging field? You know, you can tell them all the statistics about where the jobs are going to be, but that doesn't always do it. So I, I think, you know, that's a struggle I have. I would love to hear from others. And I think, you know, for me, we women are supposed to be such influences in socialization, right? Mm -hmm. Because of mm -hmm. our connections we form with people. And right. so we maybe can do this more effectively than men. I don't know. But I would love to w think of ways to do it. It is kind of um, encouraging when you come to meetings like GSA and you see all these young people. And I think it's just because we're getting older. <laughs> you know, they, they look younger. But I'm thinking, well, they're still coming. Someone's being successful at this. I wish they could help me see better ways to do it. Because I don't feel as if I'm as successful at encouraging young people to study gerontology as I could be. I think all of us struggle. All of us as academics struggle with that. Mm -hmm. And I, I had a conversation earlier today basically on the same exact thing. And, and we're like, how do we get them excited? And how do we show them the various careers mm -hmm. in aging? And so, you know, really to learn it from our other colleagues. Mm -hmm. and, but you're right. What someone works. is doing something right because we're getting some really yeah. incredible young women in the field and, mm -hmm. and even some middle-aged women in mm -hmm. the field mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how are we attracting right know, and how can we do it better yeah I think one and one way in undergraduate courses I've always tried to um, bring in older adults to interact with them because I think part of it is just this total either fear mm -hmm. and fear mm -hmm. because they really haven't spent a lot of time you know one of the things Gunhill uh, my former advisor writes about is, you know, the U.S. is one of the most age-segregated societies, and Why? unlike many parts of Europe and stuff where there's a lot more age integration. So we have these people just have had no interaction, and maybe with their own grandparents, but their own grandparents are probably 60 years old. Exactly. Even no, though some people yeah. call that old age. <laughs> so, well, oh yeah. <laughs> but, you know, so I think part of it is just exposing them so they feel more comfort and even open. So I'll bring older adults into the classroom and we as a class will interview them and n never fails. Every time I have courses like this, students, the first thing they mention liking about the class, they love meeting these older people. Wow. And I try to get a range so they see they're not all ill and frail, um, but some are. And, you know, and some have overcome amazing uh, hardship, you know, with functional health or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, so part of it is just that exposure thing. So it's trying to think of ways we can expose even people before college. How can right. we do it earlier? Right. How can we think of a community uh, volunteering and engagement activities that would involve younger children and and not just with people who are frail and institutionalized because that's the image they have and well because if you image. think of how and I've done it the other way too where I've taken classes to long-term care facilities uh -huh. well that's not what I'm ever going to do again yeah. because first of all it's you know it's a little frightening to them they're having to totally not only interact but go to this totally foreign physical environment to them, and then you get just masses of people who aren't functioning well, and that's and then they get those those right, stereotypes right. kind of reinforced, right? So I do feel a little like, well, am I misleading them by bringing in all these community dwelling, higher functioning people? And I think, well, no, not really, because that's what the majority of the exactly. elderly population is. Exactly. Yeah, and, and it, it's and not it, like none of them ha are perfect health. They yeah. talk about having had strokes or, you know, not being able to drive anymore, things of that nature.